Open your Bibles to John 2. John 2, we'll start in verse 13. Every culture has their monuments that mean great things historically. Uh, Many of ours have been in hot controversy this year. Um, America has the Washington Monument, the Lincoln Memorial, the Arlington Cemetery, Mount Rushmore, so many others. Um, If you go up to the Smoky Mountains, there's an area there called Cades Cove. Um, I I got to go there a couple years ago, the first time I had been to actual Cades Cove, despite that I had been to the Smoky Mountains about a dozen times. Um, All over that trail, Cades Cove, there are old churches that I don't think people meet in anymore, but, but they're old churches. I love going to old churches. It's a monument of the past. It's a monument of, of all the believers who have met there to worship for generations, um, long before any of us were here. Um, even here in Tifton, many of the things at the Agarama are monuments of the past, even if a lot of them weren't actually from Tifton, but from the surrounding area. Uh, that they're, they're monuments of the past that mean a great deal historically. And the Jewish culture had many monuments as well, but the greatest one of those was the temple, the temple in Jerusalem. Um, for the purpose of us understanding what's happening in the story today, I've got to kind of tell you the, the, the history of that temple. Um, so King David wanted to build a temple that would be God's house, but David was a man of war. So God said, you're not going to build the house your son Solomon is going to. So he builds it. Solomon builds it. It's one of the most incredible structures ever built at that time. Glorious, shining with gold, massive. Um, Solomon built that temple in 949 B.C. When he builds it, the glory of God descends like a cloud and enters into that temple and remains there. So now when the priests come, they offer sacrifices actually in the presence of God. However, as the Jewish people were so sinful, they descended into madness. Um, Eventually, God brought judgment on the nation. And the Babylonians came in and and destroyed the place. And in the process of that happening, the temple was destroyed. The the temple Solomon built was was wiped off the land. That happened in 586 B.C. Um, They're in exile for 70 years in Babylon, and they get to return. They get to come back to the land of Israel. They build a second temple. They build it in 515 B.C. Interestingly enough, this time the glory of God doesn't descend like a cloud and enter the place. It it doesn't. The second temple is complete in 515 B.C., and it's there. In 20 B.C., King Herod decided to renovate the place. He decided to do a renovation project. He was probably watching HGTV or something and decided, we're going to make this place updated a little bit. Um, So he starts renovating. The actual temple renovation took a year or two, but the renovations on the area around the temple went on until 64 A.D., so about 80 years give or take a few years Um, and and that's where we're at today Jesus is is at the temple during that time of renovation the temple was arguably the most important monument for the Jews but the second temple had never had the glory of God within it until the passage that we're at today John 2 Jesus is the glory of God in flesh and he's going to walk into the temple and the glory of God is going to be here for the first time John 2 through 4 is showing, as we said last week, it's this bookend of Cana, uh, a miracle in Cana and another miracle in Cana. In between that, it's showing how Jesus is better than uh, a bunch of Jewish institutions. So last week was a wedding. This week is the temple. We're going to get to a rabbi and to an ancient well as we go through this. It's showing how Jesus is better than these things. And so let's read the passage. John 2, starting verse 13. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. 
And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. It is Passover at this point in the story. Passover was a huge holiday for the Jewish people. Um, it remembered that time in Exodus when um, God sent the spirit of death into the camp of Egypt and they had to put the blood on the doorpost to protect those in their house. And all those who didn't have the blood, post, the blood on their doorpost, um, the, the children in that home were, were, were killed by the angel of death. Um, Passover is something they celebrate every year to remember God's deliverance of them from the people of, of, of Egypt. Um, it was a major celebration, so think Christmas for us and then multiply that but substantially. That, that's, that's how elaborate this is for the Jewish people. Every Jewish male was required to attend Jerusalem for three feasts every year. Um, that was Passover, Pentecost, and the, the Feast of Tabernacles. They were required to come to Jerusalem and celebrate this. Um, there are at least three Passovers in the book of John. We've got this one here in chapter 2. We'll see it again in chapter 6, and then one in chapter 12, which is taking place when Jesus is crucified. John is going to cover, because of that, we know that Jesus' ministry is around three years because of those Passovers. I think there's a good argument that Jesus' ministry was three and a half years, but we'd have to get into that another time. But Jesus is going to be doing his ministry for at least three years because there's three Passovers in the course of that time. So Jesus comes to the temple on Passover. He walks in, and there are people, there's a farmer's market set up. And he sees it, and it infuriates him. So when I was a kid, I don't know if they still do this in school or not, but when I was a kid, there was this catalog that we would get every year, and we would take that catalog and sell it to all of our neighbors and and mom's bowling team and, and all of that. And depending on the amount of stuff that you sold, you got a certain amount of prizes for, for the amount of money that you took in. Um, my mom was on a bowling league. She went Monday and Thursday to bowl. She always took it, sold like crazy, and I was always the number one seller every single year in school because of that. I didn't sell a dime, but, but my mom did. And so I got the, the beatbox and the, and the, the radio and, and all the stuff that you got from it. Um, but during that time, my dad always told me I couldn't sell any of that stuff at church because he said, Jesus says you can't sell stuff in the temple. Is that exactly what's going on here? You know, is it wrong for, you know, one of our youth to come here and sell something to, to you in, in the chair over and, and that sort of thing? Well, I think there's two things happening here in this story. First of all, the, they're ripping the people off. We get that from, from other other accounts of this story that they're being ripped off by the Jewish people. Um, you know, this probably started as a ministry. It probably started as as a good thing. You know, the, there's people traveling all over from the nation of Israel. They're, they're coming in to Jerusalem for this celebration. If they live a hundred miles away and they got to walk by foot, it's just a little difficult to bring a sacrifice that whole way on foot. So perhaps they started this in order to um, provide them, hey, you can come here and buy your sacrifice instead of having to bring it hundreds of miles on foot. Um, however, it is turned into exploitation of the poor. People are paying high money for something that is not worth that high of money. It's kind of like, um, you, you know when you buy a bag of potato chips at the store? You pay like $4 for it, and you get it home, and you open it up, and you look way down in there, and there's like half a bag of chips there, and you're like, where's the rest of my chips? Like, that's kind of what's going on here. They're paying for a whole bag of chips, and they're getting about half a bag. Um, and, and, and so Jesus sees this. Um, you know, it's kind of like, like the lottery. 
There's not technically a Bible verse that says don't buy scratch-offs and Powerball tickets, but let, let me just tell you why the lottery is evil. Um, people who are well off are not typically the ones that buy lottery tickets. Poor people do. So a poor single mother buys a lottery ticket hoping she's going to hit it big and be able to buy her children a future. And then she doesn't win. And that money she spent on the lottery ticket could have been used to buy those kids food today. The lottery promises hope to the hopeless and then it doesn't deliver. It exploits the poor. You might say, but it goes to education. The money that comes in on lottery goes to education. Maybe it does, but it still exploits the poor. That'd be like saying, that'd be like Planned Parenthood starting to give some of their money to support education. It wouldn't justify what they do. It, it wouldn't. It's still evil. If you justify playing the lottery by saying it supports education, please just donate your money to education. Just do that. Don't support an evil empire that seeks to exploit the poor. The Jewish leaders are exploiting the poor in the temple, and it makes Jesus furious. It makes him furious. So first, they're ripping people off. Secondly, they're interrupting worship for some people. They're interrupting them. Understand what the temple looked like. In the middle, you had the Holy of Holies. That's where God dwelt, or in this case, didn't in this temple. Um, the, the, the court outside of that was the court of the priest, the Jewish priest. Outside of that was Jewish men, Jewish women and children, and the next one. And then the outer court was the court of the Gentiles, people who were not Jewish. Um, that, that's how it was set up. You could get closer to God depending on who you were. Well, we know from other accounts of this in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that they're doing this in the court of the Gentiles. They're not doing it out in the street right in front of the temple. They're doing it in the temple, in the court of the Gentiles, where the Gentiles come and pray, where the Gentiles come to worship. They're, they've set up a farmer's market there. This is why Jesus says in Mark's account of this, my father's house will be called a house of prayer for all the nations. And it can't be that because there's donkeys and cattle running around when, when people are trying to have silent prayer. They're trying to seek the God of Israel, but they can't because this farmer's market's here. And this makes Jesus furious. So Jesus makes a whip See that in verse 15? He makes a whip. Interestingly is, um, Jesus doesn't just come in. That's how a lot of movies of Jesus make this look. He comes in, sees it, and just immediately goes crazy and starts flipping tables everywhere. Like, that's not what happens. Jesus sets down, he gets a cord, and he puts a whip together, just watching them all. Slow and methodical. He's putting this whip together. This whole thing that Jesus is going to do, it is slow and premeditated. The, the wrath of God is not brash, quick, or off the cuff. It's thought out. God is not a troubled high school student who, if you wrong him, he's going to punch you in the face. Like, like that's not who God is. He is slow and methodical in his punishment of evil. He thinks it through, and then he does it. Do you look around at the world and see all the evil in the world and think, God, why haven't you come and punished all this yet? What, why is this still here? He's slowly making a whip right now. And he will come and flip the tables. But he's giving it time. For whatever reason, he's doing that. Jesus cleanses the temple. He runs people out of there. You, you notice this takes place at the beginning of the, of the book of John. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it takes place at the end during the week that Jesus dies. doesn't happen like that here. Um, so the question arises, did Jesus do this twice? If not, is John just whacked up? Did he put this in the wrong spot in the book? Well, there's two options with that. Um, he, he might have just cleansed the temple once, and for theological purposes, John put it at the beginning and not at the end. Or... It might have been that he did it twice. Once at the beginning of his ministry and once at the end. I tend to lean toward that second option. He did it twice. 
I think the details in this passage seem to indicate that this was not during the, the week that Jesus died. Because you notice they say they've been working on this temple for 46 years. We know from history it started in 20 BC. That puts this around 26 AD. That's not when Jesus was crucified. He was crucified in 30 or 31. At Jesus' trial, they actually use what he says is here to um, try to try to accuse him. You know that he'll destroy the temple and build it in three days. But they really can't get their they can't get their stuff straight at the trial. It's kind of like he said this a few years ago and not just a couple days ago. So so I think he did this twice. So Jesus is making this whip. He finishes the whip and he begins to purge the temple of unrighteousness. He runs those selling animals out. He turns tables over where the receipts are being made. Coins spill out all over the ground. He's swinging the whip everywhere. Did he hit people with the whip? I don't know. But he, he at least used it to strike fear in people to get them to leave. This is a Jesus of holy wrath. A Jesus who is willing to punish evil, to run evil out of the place. He's not the puny fairy tale character that we've turned Jesus into. He's, he, he is holy and full of wrath. He's greatly concerned with righteousness, and he is willing to make a whip and drive people out of the temple. He's willing to do that. We come to verse 17. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. That's a quote from Psalm 69, verse 9. Um, this zeal that Jesus has here is a fulfillment of the Old Testament. The disciples are actually going to remember his zeal twice in this passage, verse 17 and then verse 22. Um, zeal for God's house and God's ways consume Jesus. Jesus is zealous for God's ways because we aren't. Jesus had to be the perfect man because none of us have been that. All of us have fallen short. All of us have failed. You know, one of my favorite hymns is Rock of Ages, Clef for Me. Um, there's a verse of that song. I don't think it's in our hymnal, actually. Um, they've added some verses to it over the years. But, but one of the verses is, Not the labors of my hand can fulfill the law's demands. Could my zeal no respite? No. Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. That is, I am so filled with sin, it doesn't matter how zealous for Christ I am, I could never pay for all my sins. It doesn't matter how, many, how much sacrifice I make, how much money I give, how many times I come to church, I'm never going to measure up. And that's why Jesus had to come. That's why he had to come die for me, because I could not save myself. His zeal will be seen even more in the second part of this passage. They come to him and they say, what sign do you do to show that you can do these things? They ask for a sign. Jesus is going to do seven signs in the book of John to manifest his glory. Remember the water into wine. That was his first one. Um, this scene is kind of similar to Matthew 16 where the Pharisees come and ask Jesus for a sign. They say, what sign can you give us to show that you are, are who you are? And he says, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. Jesus in other places compares his, his being in the grave to Jonah being in the fish. And as Jonah came out of the fish in three days, the Son of Man is going to come out of the grave in three days. And here Jesus gives a similar sign. He says, go ahead and destroy this temple. Tear down this temple, and I'll rebuild it in three days. I'll raise it back up in three days. And they hear that, and they don't understand, because, because this temple's been being worked on for 46 years at this point. It's like an American interstate. It's, 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 working, it's being worked on as long as I can remember. Um, that they, they hear this, and they don't understand. It's a common thing in John. Jesus will teach something spiritual, and they'll understand it physical. Um, so he says, those who eat the flesh of the Son of Man will have life. And they think, how in the world can I take a bite out of your arm? That doesn't work. Um, he, he says, you must be born again. And Nicodemus asks, how can I actually enter my mother's womb and be born a second time? That doesn't make any sense. And here, Jesus says, destroy the temple, 
and I'll raise it up in three days. And they're looking around at the temple they're in, and they're like, that's never going to happen. It's just not going to happen. Are you really going to do this in three days? But this temple they're in wasn't technically a temple because it's not the place God dwelt. If, if, if a temple is where God's presence is and glory dwells, this is not a temple. This is just a building. The, the glory of God is in the temple currently, but it's in Jesus, not in the actual building. He's the actual temple here. That's the temple he's speaking of. Destroy my body and I'll raise it up in three days. And that's exactly what he's going to do. And his disciples hear this. They're with him. They hear this. And they, when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered. Remember verse 17 had the word remembered. Verse 22 has the word remembered. They remembered this. Jesus is going to show his zealousness in being willing to go to the cross. He's going to show his zeal for God's ways, not just in clearing the temple out, but in dying for the sins of the world. That's how zealous and committed he is. Everybody else would have given up long before that. They would have said, hey, humanity, you're on your own. Figure it out yourself. Jesus will go to his brutal death for you. That's how zealous he is for you. He will rise again for you. That's how zealous he is for you. Jesus is the true temple. He's the point of the temple that Solomon originally built. And it was all going to point to the day when the word would become flesh and dwell among us. That day is here. So the temple is no longer needed. This temple he is in is no longer needed. So what happens to this temple? It's a good question. As I said, the renovations of this temple would continue until 64 AD. However, in 70 AD, this temple would be destroyed by the Roman Empire the same way that the temple was destroyed by the Babylonians. Just six or seven years after it was finished, it will be destroyed. Um, near the end of the ministry of Jesus, he gives what we call the Sermon on the Mount of Olives. Um, it's in Matthew 24. I'm going to read a couple verses from it. We often turn to this passage uh, to look at signs that we're living in the end of, end of the world, especially right now we, we do this. Um, and there's certainly things in here about the end of the world, but, but, but there's also things in here about what's going to happen in 70 AD. Matthew 24. We tend to not read the, the words around these signs. We just read the signs and we're like, whoa. That's happening on CNN right now. The wars and the famines and the earthquakes and the persecution of Christians and the nation rising against nation. And, and we, we tend to watch the news and say, oh, that's happening. We're in the end of the world. But just look at what Jesus, look at what happens. So Matthew, he goes in the temple and clears the temple in 21. And then everything he does in the, in the book from that point on is in the temple. 22 and 23. 24, he leaves the temple. Verse 1. Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, you see all these? Truly I say to you, there will not be one stone left upon another. They'll all be thrown down. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the signs of your coming and of the end of the age? They hear Jesus say this, and they don't understand the death and resurrection yet. They think it's all going to happen at the same time. That his coming and the, this destruction of the temple that he's just said, they're going to happen at the same time. He's, he's telling them, no, they're not going to happen at the same time. He's going to tell about the destruction of the temple, then he's going to tell about his coming separately. So he gets to verse 15. He's already said all the signs, wars, famines, disease, all that stuff. Verse 15, he says, So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Often that is thought to be referring strictly to the Antichrist at the end of history, 
And maybe that's a second fulfillment of it, but he's speaking to the disciples here. He says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel, somebody's going to come in and wreck this place, and you're going to see it, is what he's saying. It even says, let the reader understand. The person this is written to is not primarily 21st century people, but 1st century Christians. Let the reader understand. You know who this is, is what it's saying. In 70 AD, a Roman ruler named Titus is going to come in and level the place. He's going to knock the temple down. He actually gets a saw and saws every single stone off the thing and knocks it over. Just like Jesus said, not one stone is going to be left on top of this thing because they rejected the Messiah. So, so God allowed the temple to be desolated. When Jesus dies on the cross, the curtain of the temple is torn in two rendering it null and void. This temple is no longer needed. So what Jesus declares in John 2 and Matthew 24, and when he dies on the cross, what he does spiritually there happens literally in uh, 40 years. The temple is destroyed, and there has never been a Jewish temple in Jerusalem since. In fact, in the spot where this temple was today, a giant mosque sits there. It's called the Dome of the Rock. So what's the point of all this? Why'd we take a detour and go and look at this? The point of all this is, this isn't just some historical event that happened thousands of years ago. You, you should care that this happened because it has great implications for your walk with Christ. You no longer have to go to a specific spot on planet Earth three times a year to offer sacrifices to God. Christ is the temple, not the building in Jerusalem. He's the temple, and he's filled us with his spirit so that now we're temples of the living God. Christ came to do away with the temple so that you can meet with God whenever, wherever you are. He's going to say in just a couple chapters in John, the day is coming when you won't worship God on this mountain or in Jerusalem, but you'll worship the Father in spirit and truth wherever you are. You will be able to worship him. That's what we read in Hebrews 4, that he, is the, that, that he has made it so that we can draw near to the throne of grace and receive help in times of need. Not have to go to Jerusalem to get it. We can get it right here in this building or in our house or in our car as we're driving down the road. We can get that because Jesus did away with the need for the temple. If you're a Christian, you have full access to God right here, right now, and wherever you are. When you pray, you can trust that God is actually listening to you and present with you. And Jesus made this possible. You should be glad the temple in Jerusalem is gone. I would have loved to see the thing, but, but Jesus is the temple for you. He's your temple. Next time you pray, know that you're able to approach the throne of grace through Christ who became a temple for you. And Jesus was so concerned that you get to do this that he literally made a whip and ran people out of the temple. Let's pray together. Father, I praise you that we do not have to approach you through blood and goats and blood of goats anymore. We don't have to offer incense to you. We don't have to make a trek to Jerusalem, as that'd be a lot harder for us than it was for even these people in, in Jesus' day. Lord, we don't have to go to a specific spot. You have opened it up to where we can seek your face wherever, whenever. Oh, Lord, what a good God you are. What a wonderful God you are. We worship you. God, would you help us this week, as we go throughout our week, to not neglect coming before you, coming to the throne of grace, knowing that you sympathize with our weaknesses, that you are for us, and you will help us, and that we would come with confidence. In Jesus' name, amen.